Welcome to The Power Is Now. My name is Eric Frazier. It's a beautiful day in Southern California, a great day to talk about real estate. Now, this is our second year of talking about the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act uh, began 54 years ago, and we decided last year, and we just made a commitment that we're going to talk about this important piece of legislation uh, for as long as the power is now is in existence. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, this is our second year in this series of discussions with industry leaders about the 1968 Fair Housing Act, how important it is, what can we do to make it more effective? How can we put some teeth behind enforcement of it? And why haven't things really changed in terms of the rate of home ownership, particularly for African-Americans and other minorities? And so with me today, uh, we have an industry, a true industry leader, both in real estate and in mortgage and in just really politics, if you will, as it relates to real estate and mortgage. His name is Ed Delgado, and he is the managing director of Mortgage Policy Advisors based in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Ed, to the program. Eric, it is always a pleasure to see you and your, your beaming smile. It's, uh, it's great to be with you again. Ed, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. I really enjoy our discussions and you always seem to elevate the conversation regardless of the topic. And so you have a permanent place here on The Power Is Now. Anytime we are talking about important subject matters as it relates to real estate and banking. And today, is a very important topic, the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And I just can't wait to get your perspective on the law and what we can do to perhaps uh, uh, make things better as a result of the law for everyone. Now, folks, before we bring Ed on, we're gonna take a quick commercial break and to talk about uh, you know, fair housing as well as uh, other things that we have going on here at The Power Is Now, I want to invite you to go to our website at thepowerisnow.com, and there you'll find magazines, you'll find podcasts, TV shows, all centered around real estate. Our goal is to educate and to inform consumers and real estate professionals about what's happening in real estate. It is not entertainment, it is information. And our goal is to be the HDTV of real estate information uh, like they are of interstate uh, real estate uh, entertainment across the nation. So you're listening to The Power Is Now TV. For those of you who are watching us on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and the podcast, stay tuned. When we come back, you're going to hear more from Ed Delgado right here on The Power Is Now. Want to keep up with the current developments happening in the world of real estate? The Real Estate Roundtable, hosted by Eric L. Frazier, is a show you do not want to miss. The show features a panel of VIP agents who are passionate about helping people. It is what they do best. They discuss today's hot topics, latest market updates and trends. The panel also conducts interviews with prominent figures in the industry. New episode every Friday live on Facebook and replay on the Power Is Now YouTube channel. And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to The Powers Now TV. This is our second year in talking about the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And with us today is Ed Delgado. He's a managing director of Mortgage Policy Advisors based in Washington, D.C. And uh, Ed is here to talk about the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Thank you again, Ed, for joining us. And let's get right into it. Eric, uh, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me on the show. And uh... Listen, before we get started, thank you for all you do for the industry. Uh, as you said, you are a, uh, an anchor of information. People rely on you, and you and I go way back. We've been working together for a number of years. Um, I, I, I think uh, you, you didn't have that white beard when I met you, and, and I, I didn't have this extra 20, 30 pounds around my belly when I met you. So uh, 
We're aging gracefully together, sir, and it's a privilege and an honor to do so. So thank you for having me. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know if I'm aging gracefully. For sure you are, though, man. You still get that baby skin. So yeah. you're looking good, Ed. Thank you. Now, Ed, tell our audience a little bit about your role as the managing director of the Mortgage Policy Advisors. Yeah, and thanks for that. Uh, look, uh, Mortgage Policy Advisors is a mouthful. We call it MPA. It's essentially, we work with clients on policy, regulatory advice, strategic business uh, counsel, and then uh, business development, third party outside sales uh, support for those organizations. And um, that, or, that company started about two years ago. And my partner, Marcel Breyer and I are, uh, we just love every day. I still am affiliated with Five Star. I'm still uh, uh, chairman of that organization. I consider that an honor as well. And hopefully many of your, your listeners are, uh, and viewers are familiar with Five Star Institute and great work they do in the uh, membership conferences and editorial space. So that's what I've been up to uh, past couple of years. Ed, your involvement in real estate and, and now in your current position, uh, you kind of, you know, it's really a necessity for you to stay on top of what's going on, uh, whether it be uh, legislation or policy uh, as relates to real estate and housing. And April, as you know, is Fair Housing Month. And um, I, I think it's important uh, for, you know, all of us to really take in consideration like we do, you know, other months of the year, uh, how critical, how important fair housing is to everyone. And it should be a discussion on every kitchen table. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we always uh, identify with housing being part of the American dream. That's a very lofty identification, right? And your the American dream is home ownership. And uh, I think that this is a timely discussion. I think the relevance of the Fair Housing Act simply cannot be understated. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of your questions and being able to share some thoughts and views with your audience. Well, let's start there in terms of how important is the Fair Housing Act. Uh, there are many who believe that we don't really need a Fair Housing Act. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the same group that believe we don't really need any laws at all, right, as it relates <laughs> to discrimination. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, do we need a Fair Housing Act uh, today? Uh, Yes, I mean, and the simple answer is yes. And I think you, you mentioned it at the start of your program is that this act was born 54 years ago. But I think it's as important, if not more so important today, given the expansion of home ownership and the diversification of America. Um, you know, if we simplify the act, what, what does it stand for? Well, in summary, it's intended to prohibit discrimination in housing based on race or color or national origin, religion, sex, including sexual orientation, gender identity, familial status, and disability. So that's a, that's a lot to cover as an act. Um, and the reason why I said it's more important today than, than in recent past is that our nation um, is currently divided. Um, you know, it's sad for me to say, but we are divided as a nation. And, we see it on the streets. Uh, we watch it on the news on a nightly basis about hostility, Americans versus Americans. Um, if you're a fan of social media, it just, it permeates every channel of social media out there. So you have a lot of hostility and anger that effectively has replaced common courtesy and respect for all Americans. And it's this ignorance that I think we have a responsibility to make sure it doesn't permeate the housing market. Um, you know, I said something in, uh, to you off air where I said discrimination doesn't discriminate. And I, I'm not trying to be cute. Discrimination can go against, uh, you know, commonly we see it against black or African Americans, against Latinos. Uh, you know, at the height of COVID, there was a lot of violence against Asian Americans in this nation. There's violence against people with different sexual orientation. So, you know, I think we all, all of us that participate in the ecosystem of housing have a duty and responsibility to make sure that that ignorance doesn't impact our industry that we're all so proud to serve in. 
You know, and I, I agree with you. And I also think it's not just those who participate in the ecosystem, the, you know, as professionals or service providers, but I believe that it also, the responsibility lies with every citizen of this country. If you truly believe in the, the ideals of what, you know, of America, what that means in terms of freedom and opportunity, uh, then you also want to embrace your, your saying, by the way, which I think is great, discrimination uh, doesn't discriminate. Anybody could be a victim of discrimination. And if it's not your race or your religion or your, your, your ethnicity, uh, it could be your, your health situation. Like you mentioned earlier with COVID, it could be your disability, which is prohibited now by law, but discrimination does not discriminate. And I think that's a great quote, folks. You may want to mark that down. Make sure you give Ed credit. Discrimination does not discriminate. Yeah, look, my wife told me before I did this, uh, don't, don't put on your political cap. So I'm <laughs> cautious. You, 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 ne you never want to pit red against blue. Uh, but the reality is, uh, look, I think we've lost our way as a nation, right? I, I think we've lost, there is, it's okay to be different. Our nation was founded on differences. Um, it's what makes this nation as great as it is, is that we can have intellectual conversation about our differences and find a common resolve towards the benefit, benefit of all. Uh, but the moment you disrespect or dismiss or, or uh, denounce somebody else's view, that without accepting it for what it is, then it starts to breed this ignorance that I think we're talking about. So back to the Fair Housing Act, I think it was established uh, as a means by which we can move forward as a nation. And you think about the, the turbulent times that the act was brought about with 1968. Um, I was only five or six years old in 1968. Um, so I don't have firsthand memory, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a fan and, and student of history and to see the turmoil and the nation get torn apart uh, with the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and, and uh, Bobby Kennedy. I mean, this, this nation was in turmoil. Um, and from that conflict came about this act that here we are more than half a century later talking about its value. So there is a path in which our nation heals and learns from our mistakes and moves forward. And I'm hoping that, you know, again, programs like yours that bring about an opportunity to have an open, honest dialogue benefit uh, those that or need of home ownership. We should be able to have an open and honest dialogue. And perhaps uh, it is the red versus blue. It is people just, you know, digging in and, uh, and uh, with their views that, uh, that really support maybe a more, you know, homogeneous society where, you know, separate and equal, so to speak, and which is not a reality. We need to come together, and uh, and not coming together, uh, ever since the from the 1964 Civil Rights Act to the 1968 Fair Housing Act, we are still seeing from that point to this very day a great deal of turmoil and conflict and unrest, uh, and as a result of that, you know you have many groups that have come up. One notably, Black Lives Matter, because of the uh, the unarmed shooting of African Americans. And uh, this gets into more of just life in America, the, you know, being able to enjoy uh, the freedoms we all, we want to enjoy in America. Uh, but it, 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 it also goes down to just being able to transact business in America. And I mean, well into the seventies and eighties, many African Americans could not be members of real estate associations. And so, the impact of that legislation uh, has, has, you know, was immediate in some respects in that it was law, uh, but the adoption of the law, well, that's still a problem. Yep. No, I, I, I think it is, right? It, but look, um, I, I do want to be positive, right? So it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we have to always march forward, right? And I, I think if we take a look at the housing industry today, 
And I, I would ask you and your listeners, are we better off today than we were 15, 20 years ago? And the answer is yes. Are we better off than where we were 50 years ago? The answer is yes. Are we better today than we will be 10 years from tomorrow? The answer is no, right? So you, you have to look at this, in my opinion, Eric, you have to look at this as we're making progress. Sometimes that progress is painfully slow and almost imperceptible uh, day after day and sometimes year after year. But I think we have to keep moving forward because that's the only way you're going to affect change. And that change hopefully brings about a, a better industry for us all. So, you know, it's sad, right? And there's a lot of uh, uh, bad things that happened in our industry over the last 50 years. And we don't like to talk about it, but we need to because that's how you learn, right? And I, I, again, going back to this act, I'm, you know, when I got the invite, I was like, what a brilliant thing to do is talk about and this act and why it's relevant today, or is it even relevant today? And what does it mean to us going forward? And what changes can we make to, to improve on the act? Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Well, many people, again, think that, you know, the Fair Housing Act is just another, you know, liberal law out there to enforce something that's really not happening. And I think uh, people who feel that way may have never been a victim of discrimination. Have you ever been a victim of discrimination? That's a broad question. And that wasn't part of the rehearsal. Um, <laughs> I have been a victim of discrimination by my definition of discrimination. I don't know that it fits the, the universal prototype. Um, but I would like to share with you a story of a, a very uh, poignant time in my life where uh, somebody shared with me firsthand their experience of discrimination. So uh, with your permission, I'll just go into a quick story. Um, so I was invited to a meeting that was being held at a conference um, for the LGBTQ community. And they had a lineup of really impressive speakers. I believe Ellen DeGeneres' mom was attending. They had uh, uh, TV personalities, movie personalities. And it was, it was a conference to talk about some of the conditions and some of the challenges being part of that community. I was invited because I had a meeting scheduled with HUD Secretary Julian Castro, who at the time was serving in the Obama administration. And the point of that meeting was frankly to talk to him about a need to reform um, vacant uh, property legislation and rules and uh, foreclosure. <clears throat> so not directly related to L LGBT um, issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, while uh, they said, well, the secretary is, is finishing up a meeting, Mr. Delgado, if you could wait in the green room, we'll find you when he's available to speak to you. So I, I went into the green room and it was a, a pretty cool experience, right? You got TV personnel and, and I'm a nobody. I'm an absolute nobody in this room, but I recognize, hey, hey I've seen that person before that will be. And then I see a, a uh, and in the interest of privacy, I'm not going to share the individual's name, but I see a very statuesque woman, uh, black woman walking towards me. And she is tall and intimidating and she does not look happy. And I don't know her, Eric, I have no idea who she is, but you can see when someone has a line on you and they're like, oh, I'm talking to that person. So she got up to within about a foot of my face and she said, you're the mortgage guy, aren't you? And I'm like, no, but I, I could talk to you. Is everything okay? And she goes, sit down for a minute. And I, again, she was tall. So I sat down, I listened, you know? And uh, she said something that hurt uh, right out of the gate. She said, why can't I get a mortgage? And I went into banker mode. Right? I said, well, it, it, you know, qualifying for a mortgage is a very complex experience and requires a complete review of your financials, including debt to income ratios, both front end and back on. And then there, of course, consideration of the loan to value. And I'm going through all the mechanics and she said, sweetie, you're not listening to me. Why can't I, as a transgender woman, get a mortgage? And I said, well, that's a pretty serious allegation. Are you saying that you're not being approved for a mortgage because you're transgender. And she said, that is exactly what I'm saying. I said, 
And then again, being somewhat ignorant myself at times, I said, are you sure it's not about money? It's not about the finances. And she said, she touched my hand and she said, honey, I make more money than you 10 times over. Trust me, I get paid. And I was like, okay, again, I believe you. She said, it's not about money. It's about who I am. I said, why do you say that? She said, because whenever I fill out an application, I put down my social security number and I'm asked to identify as male or female. And I identify as female. And I get kicked out of the process every single time. And she told me the bank that she applied for, and again, no names are necessary, but I said, that's, that's not right. And she said, well, it's a fraud alert that's keeping me from home ownership. So I think it's important that, and this is what, uh, six years ago, you know, pre uh, uh, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, so it was during uh, the Obama uh, administration, that kind of tells you how far we have to go because there should be no reason for exclusion based on how somebody identifies themselves by use of pronouns. Um, and I just found that story to be powerful. And I did go to work and I did call the CEO of that bank and I did champion her cause and I, I, I did not maintain contact with her. So I don't know whatever happened, but it was moving enough that it stuck with me for years that we have a problem sometimes in unconscious bias or discrimination for those that we simply, they, they don't look like us or they don't sound like us or they don't behave like us. So that gives us cause to discriminate and that's just wrong. Well, that's a that's an interesting story. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, in terms of lending, I'm not sure if anything's going to change uh, unless the government changes the Fannie Mae application uh, where, you know, they're currently, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong yet, but I don't think that it's either you male or female, and you fall into one of the ethnic or race categories. Uh, and so allowing a person to identify for who they are, um, as opposed to what maybe the government ID and, and anything yeah. else that may come up through investigation might show otherwise, because I'm, I'm a, you know, the changes aren't necessarily reported to some government entity, right? That's right. That's right. So yeah, and I, I look, I applaud the executive order that expanded the Fair Housing Act to include orientation as a means of discrimination. And, you know, we go back to slow progress. It took decades for that to come about, but it did come about. So, uh, you know, hopefully there are those that have benefited from the expansion of the rule and will continue to uh, administer, monitor, and enforce the rule, uh, not just for, for lending practices, but for real estate practices as well. Enforcing the rule, you know, uh, you're familiar with the news that came out a few years ago uh, with realtors discriminating in New York. And as a result of that, uh, NAR implemented a number of policies and training and and many state agencies are trying to bring more attention to how real estate agents uh, are treating people who don't necessarily look like them or from their communities. Um, have you seen any improvement? Do you think that there's still a problem uh, with discrimination among real estate professionals? Um, I, I think there's a problem on both sides, right? I think there's still embedded racism and discrimination in communities that impact real estate agents. And I think that, um, you know, there's bias in terms of the valuation of assets or the valuation of homes that fuel discrimination. So two quick things um, I'd like to touch on um, and provide to your audience. Are you, are you familiar with uh, the story of Eric Brown? No, go, yeah. go, ahead, but go ahead, I know it's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, so Eric Brown is uh, a Michigan real estate agent and he's black and he's showing a home to his client who's black and his client is uh, accompanied by his son who's 15 years old who's black. And the neighbor sees three black men walking into a house and what does she do? She calls the police. And uh, the police arrive 
and they order those people, the occupants of the house to immediately come outside with their hands to the air. They make them turn their backs to the police um, and they're handcuffed on the property. This is a real estate agent. So let me paint the picture. You have a group of officers, five police units in total were dispatched. And this is in broad daylight, right? This is not at, at 3 a.m. This is broad daylight midday, sun is shining, you get five police units out there in, in a suburban neighborhood. Their guns are drawn, they're handcuffing these people, all of which are black. No questions being asked, you just do what you're told. So I, I think your question was, you know, are, are agents discriminating? I'm sure they are. Uh, are agents being discriminated against? I'm sure, I'm certain they are. Um, and I think it's a problem for real estate agents, hard stop. And when you have a problem of discrimination for agents, it materially impacts or de is detrimental to the process, the buying and the selling of homes, right? If you introduce an element of discrimination or racism, you have effectively disrupted the natural order of buying and selling homes because you're tinkering with the valuation and you're tinkering with the price points and the buyers, which leads me to the underlying root cause, which is appraisals. 98%, and this is not my data, this is from the Department of Labor in the United States, 98% of home appraisers in the United States are white. I need you to think about that, 98% 98% are white. Department of Labor, I'm citing my data source. I'm not making this up. 98% of all appraisers are white. You cannot ignore what that means in terms of the development of appraisal bias, right? You're just, you have a void of color in this industry that can slant the outcome of an appraisal. And there was an interesting report from the Brookings Institute recently that said, look, uh, racial bias in terms of the valuation results in approximately 23% devaluation of homes in black neighborhoods. Well, 23% doesn't mean anything, right? It's, it's just a number, it just kind of floats in the ether. Translate that to money, it's over $150 billion in lost equity last year, $150 billion dollars that would have gone into the bank accounts of black families that were selling their home. So if you ask me, is there a problem with the system or real estate agents? Uh, do we still have a problem? Uh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's, it's a major problem. Uh, so until we advance to the point where we don't see color and we see people, we will continue to have this problem. I'm gonna say it again, because it's worth repeating. Discrimination doesn't discriminate. The same thing happens with Latino communities. The same thing happens in Asian communities. The same thing happens in white communities that have a poverty level that they say that there's some measure of, of a lack of knowledge here. So I'm gonna devalue the asset. So let's look at this from a ubiquitous standpoint. Now, are black families impacted more than poor white families? You bet they are. Yeah. <laughs> hands down, and the data substantiates that. But there is a material problem with the system. Discrimination does not discriminate. Or, yes, and I, I think I love that, that quote. I'm, I'm going to use it, Ed. I'm going to always give you credit. Discrimination does not discriminate. And it is costly uh, to those who are victims of discrimination. Uh, and you bring up something interesting. So when you cite uh, the data, uh, the uh, Bureau of Labor, right? 98% yeah. of appraisers are white. Yeah. Uh, then there are still going to be those who are going to argue and say that why does color have to do, you know, why does the race or color of a person have to do with anything? I mean, there are people who are still colorblind in this country who just believe that anytime you bring up race, that it's some type of, uh, you know, they, they turn off their, their, uh, their brains, if you will, as if they don't want to hear that. They want to believe that everybody, if given an opportunity, is going to do the right thing. Why does everything have to be about race? 
I, I don't think everything has to be about race. I, I think it's, um, look, Eric, I, you and I, again, we go way back. Um, you know, I've spent some time studying unconscious bias or subconscious bias. Um, you know, I, I often think that it's an easy excuse for somebody that isn't of color to give themselves a pass by saying, well, I know Eric Frazier, he's black, I can't possibly be racist. That's not an accurate statement. Right. And it's not to imply that I am, but I, you know, the, the hope is you, you know, well, I'm not a homophobe, my nephew is gay. Okay, well, I, I, I don't hate Asians, I love Chinese. I mean, these are really out there statements. Right. So I, I, I think it, it's more introspective. Right? People have to take a look in the mirror and say, am I truly sincere in my disposition and my opinion about my acceptance of others for who they are? A quick personal note, I, I, I try really hard not to play in social media, <laughs> too. but every now and then I'll put something out. I'm very, very fortunate. I have a lot of followers on, on my networks. Um, and I put something out that was in support of George W. Bush when he, he condemned uh, the attacks on the Capitol on January 6th. And, and former, uh, former President Bush was very proud and adamant about um, you know, defending our nation's freedoms, but also understanding that a line had been crossed. The vitriol that ensued against me was that I was a rhino and I didn't know what it meant. I had to look it up. I had to ask people, I said, what's a rhino? And they call him fat again? And they said, no, it means that you are a Republican in name only. And mm. I was like, because I supported President Bush's statement that you find it, oh, I bet you're this and I bet you voted for Obama. And I bet, and people I've never met, I ne they have no idea who I am. I just put out, a retweet of the president's statement on the capital attack. Right. So again, it, it, it's a bit of a societal issue when everybody wants to be heard, everybody's voice needs to be listened to. But I think we're, we're struggling a bit um, and taking things a little bit too far when we can condemn and convict somebody just for their beliefs. I agree with you, Ed, and to be condemned because of your position or your support of, of an idea or an idea, ideology or, or any particular position. I mean, that's the problem here that we can't have open civil discussions or to be condemned for even bringing up race uh, yeah. as a problem uh, within an organization or company or even America. And the example that you provide here, the data that you provide is supported, 98% of appraisers are white it just makes sense that there is unconscious bias. We all have it. I have unconscious bias as an African-American. You as a Latino, white people have unconscious bias. We all have some degree of unconscious bias. Uh, and But the impact of that uh, is real when uh, you have 98% of all appraisers out there who are white appraising properties of people whom they may feel you know, different about. And this gets to the question of solutions then. What is the solution? Do we need to, more, we need to have more African-American, Latino appraisers? And if so, what do we need to, how do we fix that issue? How does, uh, what kind of outreach does uh, appraisal management companies have to diversify their population? And if their unconscious bias is leading to billions of dollars of losses for African-Americans as it relates to appraisals, then I wonder what the, uh, what the representative loss is in lending. When you look at mortgage companies and banks, and I can say anecdotally, because I've been in banking for 40 years, I've always been one or two of the only African-Americans everywhere I've worked over the last 40 years. And it wouldn't surprise me yet if the percentage is similar, like 80, 90, 95% of all mortgage advisors, loan officers, loan consultants, however you want to describe them, are Caucasian. And this could be the reason why the turndown rates, the lack of outreach in African-American communities, Latino communities, 
of the a lack of opportunity and access to credit, these are some of the reasons why these things exist. I hate the word Caucasian. It sounds like a disease. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Delgado, I'm sorry, you have a Caucasian. Um, <laughs> look, I, I'll, I'll give you another catchphrase. I, I think we need to be reflective and not subjective. And, and what I'm suggesting to you is going back to the appraisal um, imbalance, uh, racial imbalance of appraisers. You want to reflect those that you serve, right? So if you're a bank, you want to reflect the community that you serve in the boardroom, on the floor, in your vendor and your supply chain. You want to reflect the ethnicity and the culture of the communities you serve. And until such time that you can create that, all you're doing is delivering a product. You're delivering a product for consumption and you're, you're not really creating or serving to your full capacity, the dream of home ownership because it's not reflective of, of the community and the residents within that community. So these are lofty goals for the industry to say, how can we do it? And look, I'll tell you what, there is a bank that I won't mention at all, and I happen to be out in uh, California. You're next. I'm an East Coast guy, but I was in. Rare for me to be in California, but I was, and I happened to be in a Latino community. And I went into a branch uh, for whatever reason, and the branch was like nothing I had ever seen before. It had bright, bright, bright colors. It had a very, very open, friendly atmosphere. It had throw rugs on the main floor of the bank. I was like, what the heck is that? I felt like I was at a coffee shop and it was a bank. And I asked the, the obvious question, this doesn't feel like a bank that I worked in New York um, or a bank where I used to have meetings in Washington. This is very inviting. And they said, we have a conscious effort to reflect the community and the majority of residents in this community happen to be of Latino descent or, and we found that this gives greater comfort. And if you look at our tellers, they're from the community and our manager is from the community. And these are people that have lived here for decades. So they're part of the cultural fabric. Right. And that to me is, again, is progress, right? We have to get there with real estate agents and appraisers and title press and technology and supply chain. but. I'm an optimist this week. I, I'd like to see more change and I think we're making progress. Yeah, change um, has to happen in order for us to see progress. I'm not sure what more we can do with laws uh, because many of the laws, like in the case of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, uh, the enforceability of that law is the question. And, and that's what I wanna get to with you. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in and, and listening or watching, uh, you're listening to Ed Delgado. And uh, Ed is always brings it uh, great information and he's challenging us to really think about what's going on and the importance of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, Ed, I love your story so far. What happened to Brown and his, uh, to the agent in, in Detroit? I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sad to see that after 54 years, we are still dealing with discrimination in housing and are looking at people because of the color of their skin as somehow a threat uh, to uh, oneself. This is the Powers Now Media. We're gonna take a quick commercial break. We're celebrating and talking about the 1968 Fair Housing Act. We'll be right back. Want to keep up with the current developments happening in the world of real estate? The Real Estate Roundtable, hosted by Eric L. Frazier, is a show you do not want to miss. The show features a panel of VIP agents who are passionate about helping people. It is what they do best. They discuss today's hot topics, latest market updates and trends. The panel also conducts interviews with prominent figures in the industry. New episode every Friday live on Facebook and replay on the Powers Now YouTube channel. Everybody and welcome to The Power Is Now. We are talking to Ed Delgado, who is a Managing Director of Mortgage Policy Advisors about the 1968 
Fair Housing Act. And we've had a great conversation. Ed, you always inspire me, educate me. I learned something new. Billions of dollars are being lost because of appraisal bias, because 98% of the appraisers out there are white. I didn't know that until right now. This is another reason why you need to tune in to the powers now. I guarantee you're going to learn something that you didn't hear before. And the stories. I didn't know about Brown. Is this Mike Brown, Ed? Is it Mike? What's his name again? Eric Brown. Eric Brown. I mean, man, what a, I can only imagine how he felt going out there to show a property. The neighbor sees him going to the house, thinks he's probably robbing the place. Five police officers show up, handcuff the guy. This is a real estate professional. Yeah. It's something to think about, man. It, it, it's, uh, well, just, just a follow up to that story. Uh, initially, the police were very apologetic, case of mistaken identity. We're very sorry to hear. Let me get these handcuffs off you right away. Uh, oops. And uh, Eric at the time was like, hey, accidents happen. Don't worry about it. Until his attorneys caught up with him and said, hey, we're going to sue everybody. And I'm not familiar with the lawsuit and I'm not taking sides, but um, hopefully Mr. Brown gets something out of it. Because look, if somebody had a gun pointed at me with my hands in the air, I, I <laughs> that's a life-changing experience. So uh, I, I feel bad. You're you bringing up the lawsuits. Um, unfortunately, lawsuits is sometimes what it takes to, to bring about change. Yeah. I mean, every, every freedom that we enjoy as African-Americans in this country is a result of federal legislation and lawsuits. I mean, it seems like you can't just leave it up to people to do the right thing. And that's that seems to be the overriding theme anytime you talk about laws that somehow uh, in, in some degree legislate, you know, morality, how people behave, you know, and uh, there are those who think, well, just we're going to do the right thing. And so we don't need more government laws or policies intervention, which brings me to the next question of for sale by owners. You know, every real estate agent uh, at one point was an unlicensed individual and perhaps in selling their home, they saw either the great job or the terrible job the realtor did and say, I can do that. I'm going to get a license, right? And now we see that real estate license are a big part of and have been for a long time uh, of the problem of discrimination, steering, and everything else you can think of that's wrong with real estate. And also they are, of course, uh, the very instrumental in, in making the American dream come true for many in which they provide support. But home buyers now, uh, home sellers, are, are trying to do it themselves for sell by owners. Uh, today is far bigger today than it has ever been. You can't hardly go online without seeing somebody offering a way for a seller to sell their homes themselves, save their money on commission, and, and get it done. And there are many people because of the advancement in technology, and we have a whole lot of people who are just smarter today the aptitude of the consumer, they feel like they can do it anyway on their own and save themselves thousands of dollars. But do they know the law? And I believe they don't. And I think that a lot of discrimination is going uh, unchecked and unchallenged happening among for sale by owners. And I wanted to get your feedback on that. Uh, you're spot on, sadly. Um, I, and I think it is a problem. It's a growing problem and concern. And I, I think the inherent risk on the for sale by owner side is potential violations of the Fair Housing Act, uh, which again is the premise behind our, our call today. Um, real estate professionals are just that. They are professionals. They are trained. They are licensed. They are tested. And it's, it's tantamount to me requiring surgery and saying, well, how hard could it be? <laughs> you know, maybe I could do it myself. Or, or maybe this person over here is kind of like a doctor. Maybe they could do it for me. No, no you, you would not take that risk of working with somebody who did not receive a formal education, didn't have the proper training, the proper licensing, licensing enforcement, and the history and the practice behind that service. So <clears throat> I think it's, it's somewhat dangerous to assume that an owner has the requisite experience to be on par with a licensed real estate professional. 
and, and, and I think, again, you're spot on, Eric. It's about, well, if I could save some money here, uh, why not do it myself? Hell, the internet's available to me. I'll just look it up. I'll know how to stage a home and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll light a candle in the living room and uh, clean up, um, put away my dirty laundry and I'll sell this house in record time. And it's a science. Um, I've sold several homes. I'm sure you, you've, I, well, I know you've managed a lot of real estate transactions, but I rely solely on the expertise of a real estate professional who uh, there's a trust there. And I'll tell you something else, Eric, I, whenever I'm, I'm buying or selling home, I interview the agents. I sit them down. It's like a job interview. I'm like, why should I hire you? You tell me why. And they'll say, well, you know, I sell this and I bet I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm hiring you because you're a professional. I need your qualifications. I'd like to learn more about you. What is your strategy? And I'll narrow it down and I'll make a selection. And at that point, I have full trust and confidence in that professional as I would a surgeon, as I would a lawyer or any other professional whose services I seek. So I am pro agent in that regard. And I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, for sale by owners. Well, I, I'm not a big fan and I realize there is some bias here. I am a licensed real estate professional and everyone in my family and I work with real estate agents, uh, but I'm also, you know, I'm an advocate for the consumer. Uh, and I just believe that uh, since real estate is such a significant part of the U.S. economy, I mean, it's about 13% of our GDP, real estate. And on top of that, it provides stability and the number one driver of wealth for just about all families, regardless of race, and even more particular for minorities. It seems to me that there ought to be some legislation or, or more control issued at the state level on those who would participate in the sale of real estate. And because we, you know, as a state and as a federal government, we we regulate and a whole lot of products, particularly in, as it relates to medicine and, and uh, other services and for selling stocks and bonds. There's a great deal of regulation and controls and a lot of, but nothing on real estate outside of being licensed. And I believe that anyone seeking to sell their home should be required to do a certain number of hours uh, of education and training in regard to the law, uh, given then a permit for a limited period of time to be able to sell their home uh, so that they cannot claim their ignorance or if they're accused of uh, discrimination, uh, then there is further evidence they, they did so knowingly and with intent. And uh, I, I'm, I really am calling on my local and, and state officials to really look at what can we do uh, to bring about, uh, you know, to, to, to create some deterrence, if you will, from discrimination happening among consumers who sell their homes, just like we are doing from those who are licensed and are under the law. Uh, they, there are deterrents there, but again, you know, they're still doing it, but at least the law is there. There's nothing that, protect, that, that really impacts the consumer if they are doing, uh, if they're selling their property specifically to people that look like them are denying uh, those an opportunity to even view their property because they, you know, they don't look like them or not from their community. And I believe this is happening. And the evidence uh, of this happening is in every state where you have whole cities that are homogeneous. I mean, am I right? I mean, Yep. There's cities where there's nothing but Latinos, nothing but Asians, nothing but Caucasians. And it's like another degree of separation uh, or segregation. And I think it starts with uh, the properties and uh, being sold and um, the individuals who are buying those properties um, wanting first to be in their communities. You know, they want to be with others that look like them. We get that. Uh, but it's preventing others who are not in their community to being able to live there and to buy that home. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, again, you're ahead of the curve, Eric. Um, you know, it's like driving a car, right? If I'm going to drive a car and that's what I'm gonna do every single day, I need a license. I need a license and I need insurance. 
But if I'm just learning and I'm trying to figure it out, I need a permit. And I, I encourage you and I applaud your efforts. I, I think owners should have the right to sell their homes, but they need to do so with a permit after completing some education, training, and certification that informs, educates them because education is the greatest cure for ignorance. You know, if you can educate people and, and, and they learn and they understand the rules of engagement, well then that acts as a deterrent for discriminatory practice. So I, I listen, if I can help you in any way with what you're pursuing, I know you're starting in California, but you could be onto something that is, has national implications in terms of helping every owner sell their home if they choose to, but create an, an entry point and you just can't randomly go sell your home because I, I think you're, you're, you're playing with fire there. And you know, the internet becomes a crutch, right? Um, I, 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 I've made the mistake of saying, how hard can it be to put in a ceiling fan? And I almost uh, burned a house down because I followed the do it yourself steps. It's not easy. It's not easy to put in a ceiling fan and anybody <laughs> that says it is doesn't know what they're talking about. So I have to hire a licensed practitioner to do that. And it's the same thing with selling your home, right? Ed, I've made the same mistake in putting in a, a garbage disposal. Don't I'll do never it. Oh. Forget about it, man. No forget way. And every now and then, here's the thing. Every now and then I'll say, I could do that. And my wife will bring up four or five or six projects that resulted in the fire department having to come to the house <laughs> or, or, or something really bad that happened. So no, I've, I've, yeah. And I too, look, it's funny you say garbage disposal. I was at Costco and I'm like, that looks really neat. I'm going to, how many horsepower is that? Oh, I'm going to get one of those. No, 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 no. Not qualified, my friend. Well, I'm glad you're making this clarification about uh, the fact that I'm not saying that a person shouldn't have the right to sell their home. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sell my home. It's, it's, it's too big for us. We're going to sell. We're going to downsize soon. And we're going to sell it ourselves. But I'm a licensed real estate broker, right? And But if I were not, then um, I would want to be required to know the law, to know the law. Yep. What, what are the do's and don'ts, you know? And like, there's certain things like, Real estate agents know you can't talk about crime in communities. You can't talk about the ethnicity, the demographics of communities, right? Uh, you can't do that. Does a consumer know that, right? You can't, there's a lot of things that the general public uh, who many every day are thinking, I wanna save money, I wanna save money, they're getting on this for sale by owner bandwagon and they don't know that they could be innocently enough violating the law, denying opportunities. And there are those who are gonna be overt about it because we know there are still uh, in this country, a lot of just bold face out there, notorious racist, white power, whatever the case might be, they exist. And so uh, there's no accountability whatsoever. And I think that um, getting a permit requiring education would be a great deterrent uh, and deterrents are a form of enforcement which brings me to our final question. Uh, well, one more after that, but uh, our final question, how, is, how do we make the 1968 Fair Housing Act more powerful? How do we add teeth to the enforcement? Here we are 54 years later, Ed, and the homeownership rate for African-Americans is the same as it was when they started just tracking it. What can we do? Yep. So. Um... I did some research as I always do before I talk to you because I want to be, sound smart and sound like you. And uh, we know that HUD is responsible for the enforcement of the act. We talked about that at the start of your program. What are the penalties for violating um, the Federal Housing Act? Well, the maximum, maximum civil penalty, this is as of 19, uh, I'm sorry, this is a 2021 for a first time violation is around $21,000. So you can, if you're uh, an agent or you're an owner and you say, listen, the good news is we haven't had any black people in this neighborhood, as far as I can remember, and you make that statement and you sell your house and your gain on sale is six figures, 
and you got to give up twenty thousand dollars not even twenty it, you know they said the max is you know what's the average well it's about five or six thousand dollars you got to peel off five grand and do that all day long so it doesn't the penalties don't act as a deterrent um, the maximum penalty is if you commit two or more violations over a seven-year period. Um, so if you're basically a repeat offender, uh, you can be fined up to $100,000. And again, I would point out to you that, look, if you're flipping homes and you're doing this as an owner or you're a, an unethical real estate agent, you're stepping all over the act. Is, is that a lot of money over seven years? You know, do the math, no. So for it to be more meaningful, first time offenders, quarter million dollar penalty. Wake up, read the, read the act, make sure you abide by the rules of the act. And if you want, it, you want to make it hurt, make it hurt. But don't do a slap in the wrist for punching somebody else in the face. That, that's not fair, fair. So that would be my, uh, you, know, you know, again, in consideration of potential illicit profits, you need to send a powerful message around the financial implications of people that break the, the law. I totally agree. And uh, again, I learned something new. I'd never really looked into what the penalties uh, were in violating the act. And I'm really just amazed. How did that even happen, Ed? $21,000. I mean, in an industry that, you know, 13% of the GDP billions of dollars being transacted and $21,000 for violating the act makes no sense. Congress needs to revisit that yeah. and add some teeth to it. Not only should there be a $250,000 fine, but there should be even some jail time, I mean, especially if you look at the Newsday series and all the realtors in New York and all the discrimination that took place, how notorious and open they were about it. That's because there's no, there's no penalty. There's, what are they going to do about it? You know, you fire know, me from my office or just go to another real estate office. Go back in time. What is $21,000 buy you today versus what it would buy you in 1968, right? So there hasn't been a material cost adjustment or penalty adjustment where let the penalty fit the crime. Yes. And if you're precluding somebody that dream of home ownership. Go back to what we said at the start. It is, it is part of the fabric and culture of being an American citizen is the right to own a home. And if you deprive somebody of that right, you're telling me that the penalty for that is $21,000. That's not enough. It's that's just not enough. enough. No. So I don't think I'm there with you on jail time because that's a totally different episode for you and I. We're not going to get there today. But I, I do believe that the penalty should be stiffer. Okay, well, we'll definitely cover the, the possibility of jail time uh, on the next year, because we want to yeah. invite you no, back. No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're you're going to get me in trouble, man. <laughs> Did you no hear problem. what he said? Oh, God. Ed, final question. Final question. As you know, you've been on the show many times, and thank you so much for making time. Uh, we have this tradition where we ask all of our guests, what does the phrase, the power is now? mean to you in the context of, you know, who you are, what you do professionally. And since we've been having this great discussion in regard to fair housing, what does it mean in the context of fair housing? The power is now. Well, I, it's a softball question um, because I think when I hear that, and in particular when you say it, because there's passion in history when you say the power is now. It's very different than when I say it than when you say it. I mean, that's your thing. Um, you are enabled with the power to be a force for good. And that time to be that force for good is now. It's immediate. It's today. It's not something that you, you put off. It's not something that you, you listen to. The power that you have to be an ambassador, to be an advocate, to be a cheerleader, to be a spokesperson, that power is now. And we're all given that gift. It's what we choose to do with it. If you choose to remain silent on issues that are critical in nature or potentially could benefit others, well, then you're not using your power the right way. One of the things I, I, I admire about you is you have developed and sustained a platform that allows people to help others. And I'm 
you know, I take it seriously when you call me and say, Ed, do you want to be on my show? Um, I, I like what you said at the very start. You bring it, Ed, and, and I do because I, I want to be part of your success and I want to follow your journey. So that's what it means to me. Now, if we take that statement and we apply it to the Fair Housing Act, the power is now to make those changes. The power is now to educate buyers and sellers. The power is now to change the racial and bias of appraisers in this nation because it is simply unacceptable and we must do better because we cannot stand by and allow ignorance to go ahead and metastasize and cripple our nation with, with racism and discrimination. And this isn't a blue thing and it's not a red thing. Stop, that's nonsense. That's easy, that, that's TV talk. That's fake news nonsense. Don't buy into that garbage. Make a difference because it's the right thing to do. And that, when you ask me, what does it mean to you? I'm speaking to you from my heart. That's what it means to me. Ed Delgado. Managing Director of Mortgage Policy Advisors based in Washington, D.C. Ed, thank you so much for doing an incredible job today in educating us, uh, inspiring us with your closing remarks about the importance of the Fair Housing Act. And I certainly hope, folks, that if you're watching, that you'll share this information. Follow us on uh, Twitter, like us on Facebook, watch this show and share it on all live streaming devices, Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, um, it's on your mobile app. Download Power Is Now TV on your mobile device and share this information. We're going to be talking about the Fair Housing Act of 1968 for the entire month of April. This is our second year of doing it, and I'm excited about the guests that we have uh, for this year's a season of uh, shows and of interviews. And so please share the information. I hope you've learned something today. I certainly have. Remember, we are at our best and we maximize our success when we act now. The power is now, folks, to make a change. You can do it. I can do it. We all can do it. Now, the views and opinions that I express today are my own. They are my own. They do not represent First Bank or any organization of which I am affiliated with or work for. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day.